A revolution is taking place in the world of flying. It's a bold push to make your trip safer and more secure. We'll show you amazing new technology on private jets that can detect danger. Explore the latest terror threats and discover how to stay safe when you climb aboard. Come along for an in-depth look on private jets staying alive. Soaring high in the clouds on a private jet means freedom. Freedom to do business where and when we want. And freedom to experience all the cultural differences and pleasures that make up our world. But in the past couple of years, flying commercially and privately has changed dramatically. Instead of simply relishing the freedom, security and safety must now be a primary concern for everyone. Americans become more and more designated targets for terrorists, and we are in the post-September uh, 11 time, which we are unfortunately had the experience that we are target, existing target for terrorists. I think everyone in the in the aviation community, whether it's commercial uh, or or general aviation, is very is very sensitive right now to the security issue, and we're all very much uh, on the lookout for suspicious behavior, something out of the ordinary, because all of us in aviation know that our future depends on being a secure form of transportation. Security must be a top priority for all travelers. New threats are being thrown at the flying public on a daily basis, and experts worldwide are lining up to beat back the bullies. Former Israeli counterintelligence agent Izzy Boyim helped develop security measures for Israel's El Al airlines. Now he's turned his attention to private jet travel. When he heard about the planes hitting the World Trade Center, he thought terrorists had used corporate jets. We believe that originally Bin Laden, when he had the idea to hit the American sky, to hit America through airplanes, I think what he had first in mind is to use the corporate jets. When I was sitting, I had my coffee when it happened, when I heard it only, I was sure we are talking about a corporate jet because I was very much aware how vulnerable this general aviation is in America and how little security measures they are taking. Bin Laden realized that, in, that it can be easy with the commercial airlines as well, so he switched his decision and most likely picked up a bigger airplane that you can make more damage. But basically, if we are talking about the concept that an airplane can become a weapon, we are in the same conditions. Experts believe that all types of aircraft could still be in Al-Qaeda's playbook. It's up to every flyer to take precautions, be aware of their surroundings, and report suspicious behavior. An airplane in general is a very vulnerable item, a very vulnerable toy. You can sabotage an airplane very easily, easier than you will sabotage an airplane, and a car. A car you can also sabotage, but the car will stay on the ground, an airplane will be on the air. Now we need to make sure that actually nobody will take the advantage. If terrorists strike another plane, it's likely to be a commercial airliner because they will kill more people and get more press. Private aircraft are also at risk, especially jets owned by high-profile companies. They are targets. If they like it or not, they, they present the corporation and they present the, the, the American dream. Business executives are being drawn into uncharted areas 
more and more companies are going global and sending not-so-savvy travelers into what could be dangerous territory. These operations are going everywhere in the world. It's not that they are going to the places that commercial airlines are going, so you can, you know what's going on. You go to places that you and me haven't heard about them, and we haven't even dreamed that, that, that there is actually a runway there, and they go. This is globalization today. Former Secret Service agent Stephen Burrell spent his career protecting presidents. He tells executives to pay close attention to their security needs. Yes, sir. Good. The threats are real. If you pick up any paper on any given day, you'll, you'll see that situations have taken place that place executives, corporations, their employees at risk. And it's imperative that security departments take these threats seriously. They take proactive steps to safeguard people, property, their, their information as well. Our vulnerability is up to us, which means we can increase or decrease our vulnerability by security measures that we are going to take. How to keep air travel safe is a hot topic around the world. Experts are creating safety guidelines for all commercial and private aircraft companies to follow. Defense starts with training the pilots and flight attendants. I think training flight crews in noticing that suspicious behavior and being able to give them some simple self-defense techniques that might once again delay an intruder to the cockpit. We've done a lot to fortify cockpit doors, but any kind of delay that we can have is a positive thing. Charlie LeBlanc, Vice President for Air Security International, is one of the foremost experts in the field of aviation security. We have to arm our flight attendants and cockpit crew members with any tool that we possibly can that will help them possibly detect an individual either trying to commit a terrorist act or a criminal act on board an aircraft. So we need to put security measures in order so the captain and the first officer, the flight attendant if you join the flight, they know these are the rules. And nobody, and we cannot, like in safety, you can have, you have to bring security into the table to merge them together, put them in the checklist, and make it a must. And in this way, you are in control. Security is one of the most important elements of business aviation. Private jet travel providers know their planes must be safe and work hard to protect their passengers. You're flying a company's very, very important assets as people. Consequently, the pilots are trained to deal with issues that might involve a hijacking or kidnapping or extortion. A company is very concerned about some irate individual doing something untoward to the airplane, so the airplanes are very, very carefully screened. The security practice in business aviation is the highest in all air transportation. Pilots are on the front lines to make sure their planes are safe and secure. They've been trained to think like the enemy. We do things maybe not as different, but look at them a little bit closer. Uh, before, when we were pre-fighting an aircraft, we might uh, uh, look into a space. Now we take a flashlight and look into the space and look into all the corners and things like that to be sure nobody's added anything extra. Careful inspection of the aircraft is crucial for the pilot. The terrorists aren't dumb. They constantly change their methods. Vigilance is important. Once we've arrived at the aircraft, what we'll do is then do the pre-flight of the outside. Check the door to be sure it hasn't been tampered with, open it up, check the book, then we'll start around the outside. We've got all of our covers on the outside, we'll start by removing those. 
The captain inspects the cockpit windows to make sure there are no fractures, then the nose to see if everything is in proper working order and that nothing has been hidden. Now, one of the reasons that we're doing this is first off to check the security and the safety of the flight, but in addition, we're doing it to be sure that nobody has stowed something in here that doesn't belong. Uh, foreign objects, uh, drugs or explosives or anything like that. Watson makes sure no pins or wires have been removed or cut from the nose gear. He goes to great lengths, pulling things apart so nothing is missed. So we'll close this back up. It's a time-consuming and tedious process. But Watson says it's important that the pre-flight inspection be done meticulously. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm staking my life on it because every time I fly this aircraft, I'm saying that the aircraft is safe to fly in all conditions. This airplane is not driving on the, on the freeway. This airplane is going to be 35,000 feet above sea level. So, uh, so we need to make sure that nobody, nobody had an, any opportunity to put something or to install something without our knowledge. Heeding that warning, anti-terrorism experts say security checks don't stop with a pre-flight inspection. We'll also identify each of the passengers by a, a government-issued ID against a manifest that we carry with the company. If there's any discrepancy, I will call into the company and find out if, in fact, a change has been made. Mr. Abernathy, John Watson, how are you, yeah, sir? Good. How are you? Good. This is Ron Hammonds. Going to be flying you today. How are you doing, Ron? Do you have some type of identification? Very good, sir. I understand we're going to Cabo San Lucas today. Okay, as soon as you're on board, we'll be ready to go. Excellent. Good. The baggage is also thoroughly inspected, making sure it has not been opened and something dangerous slipped inside. Well, let's say five passengers arrived on our aircraft and all of their bags are unloaded into a uh, to a baggage cart of some kind. We will have each of the passengers identify their bags. I'll say, is whose is this? They'll say, it's mine. And we'll go through every bag that's on there to ensure that somebody hasn't introduced a foreign object or a foreign bag in there that nobody knows about or is carrying. There are some very simple systems now being used to prevent anyone from tampering with a bag. This is a system, actually, that we like to put on every suitcase, regardless if it belongs to the passengers or the crew. You have a seal, which is numbered, and it's one-time seal. In order for somebody to open this suitcase, he needs to break the seal. Otherwise, it will not open. You see, it needs to break the seal, then it opens, and then actually it can get an access to the luggage. When all the security precautions have been completed, you're ready for your flight. After the plane lands, it's time to apply more safety measures. If we're coming into a, uh, a small airport, for the most part, we stay with the aircraft unless we're spending the night. Uh, and then usually security arrangements of some kind are made or we don't leave the aircraft there. If, uh, if the company doesn't feel that the aircraft is secure at a particular location, we'll reposition the aircraft somewhere else. There are several ways crews can protect the aircraft while it's unattended. One is a simple, low-tech solution using tape. To put on the door, now this tape is kind of unique. It's not just a sticker. What it will actually do, it determines if anybody has tampered or moved the door. Now once that's on there, if it's taken off for any reason, then it will uh, show stress marks and void marks and will know that the tape's actually been taken off. And once I pull the door, the door will begin to open and you can see it tearing. It leaves a residue here. Yeah, it, once the tape has been pulled, you can see that it, it changes color, actually has a void written on this type of style of tape, and now it cannot be closed again. Let me close it again. And you can see that there's no way to reattach it so that it looks like that it hasn't been opened up. It can't be put back on again so that it looks like uh, it hasn't been opened. 
Another anti-intrusion device is a portable sensor system. These units surround the plane with an electronic shield, a kind of invisible fence. Now, what we've done is we've deployed all three uh, units, and now what we're doing is deploying our last one. As you can see, it's really simple to do. It weighs 35 pounds, and this way we can actually accomplish how we go ahead and deploy a safe perimeter around an aircraft. A beam ties the units together and creates an electronic cocoon around the aircraft. If an intruder breaks the beam, the unit automatically calls the pilot's radio and tells him there's a problem. Intruder, intruder, detector one. Centaur 740. Once the, uh, the alarm or the alert is made, someone is going to go out there and determine if it is a hostile intruder or a friendly intruder. To make this system a little more sophisticated, closed circuit cameras can be added. And all the hardware needed to monitor the signals from the system can fit in an attache case. It can actually be quite a distance away from the airplane and have visual verification of the intruder. So the camera remains dormant for much of the time. And when an intruder comes in, it will illuminate the camera. You'll see who is there if they are friendly or foe. And then you can make your determination of how to handle that after that. These portable systems can be packed up and taken on the plane to the next location. They take about five minutes to set up, and this can be easily done by the pilot. Anytime you put up a, a safety zone, you're going to have a ripple effect. The plane is in the center, then you're going to have a perimeter around the plane, then a fence line, and then it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So you actually are making your perimeter part of a circle of safety. Once secured, the aircraft can also be used as a safe meeting center. One of the things uh, that we're seeing in some aircraft is because the communications are so good, uh, because the amenities can be uh, structured in such a way that in some uh, particularly uh, troublesome environments, people will actually stay on the plane itself because that is the most secure place for them in terms of having a communication system that they don't worry about eavesdropping, in terms of the security around the aircraft itself. So uh, oftentimes uh, on some international routes, uh, these companies use the plane as both a, a transportation tool and as a hotel tool as well. If you're an executive working for a high profile company, you have to keep changing your patterns. Never fall into a routine. Security is something you need to think about all the time. You cannot put security like you put a fence and say nothing will happen. You always have to check because the other side is not dumb stupid. The other side is getting his land you system and try to be more and more sophisticated. And you see it everywhere. Terrorism has become very sophisticated now. New threats have come with that sophistication, such as small mobile surface-to-air missiles. Also known as man-portable air defense systems, they're commonly referred to as man pads. They're capable of knocking a jet out of the sky from as far as five miles away and at an altitude of up to 13,000 feet in as little as 13 seconds. Passengers have no warning. The missile explodes as it slams into any heat-producing device on the aircraft. Even scarier, some of the simpler systems go for as little as $1,000 on the open market. Great, eh? Best estimates anywhere between 300 to 500,000 man pads out there unaccounted for. How many of those actually work, I don't know. Um, we hope that, that many of them don't work anymore. And I think because of this new threat, you will see a concerted effort by governments to better control the sale and use of these items. 
Um, so we don't have to deal with this threat 10, 15, 20 years down the road. A U.S. Department of Defense report in 2002 stated that one of the leading causes of loss of life in commercial aviation worldwide has been from MANPADS attacks. With over 30 aircraft lost since the early 1990s, the U.S. government is trying to deal with this threat and is considering several options. One approach, infrared countermeasures on all aircraft. The Department of Homeland Security has provided $100 million for development and testing of missile defense systems that can be used on both commercial and private jets. In this regard, the only thing that we can do is actually to install a missile detector actually on an airplane. The technology is available. Military forces are using it to convert it to something that uh, would be acceptable from, because all the, this technical, the, is, you are using something that will detect the missile, which means this something can present a threat to the civil aviation. To install the system is very costly. It could run anywhere from one million to three million dollars per plane. That adds up when you have to equip an entire fleet but for someone who owns only one plane, it may not be cost prohibitive. When you've paid millions for a plane, you might be able to afford the extra security. The good news is that private jets aren't as easy a target as commercial carriers. At a moment's notice, they can change their flight plan and decide to land at a different airport. A smart captain knows routine can attract trouble. Some pilots are going even further to reduce risk by retraining in simulators. In the more advanced simulator, pilots can practice evasive maneuvers using missile attack scenarios. Climb, climb. This can even help them to fly and land a damaged aircraft. Right now, there are some terrorism organizations in this world that are extremely effective and we need to make them ineffective as much as we can. It's not going to completely go away but I think con constant and consistent pressure will, will get us to that goal. Another goal for anti-terror experts is to protect their clients once they've landed. In some high-risk areas of the world, <laughs> that can be a challenging and dangerous job. New breeds of personal protection and special operations experts are being pressed into service. More and more corporate executives and government officials are turning to people like J. Kelly McCann. There are things that are immutable truths, things that you cannot control. Are there bad guys in the world? Yes. Do they want your stuff? Yes. Do, can you do things to mitigate or lessen the likelihood of your victimization? Absolutely, yes. Hey, man. McCann and his team are trained to keep his clients out of jeopardy, both in the air and on the ground. Being safe means being informed. If you're planning a business trip to a foreign country, you need to know how hot the place is. So the first thing is to jump on the internet and check the different websites or hire a vendor. Uh, iJet is one where you can go and basically engage their services and they send you regular intel updates on the region or the actual place you're going. So you're in the know when you go. You know what the political state is, you know what the economic state is, and what the ramifications of that are. Now you're more intelligent about what you're about to get into. Flying into a private airport has its own set of problems. Before the client arrives, the security detail must search the area to see if the place has been under surveillance. What you're looking for is cigarette butts. You're looking for sunflower seeds. You're looking for empty soda cans. You're looking for things that people do when they wait. Meaning that there was a reason someone was standing at that corner of this hangar that had a direct line of vision of where your jet always pulls up and where you debark. 
After the area has been swept, it's time to turn your attention to the car. McCann says there are two devices that security crews should travel with to help keep their clients safe. The first, a portable screen used to keep an infant from getting too hot. This blocks the view of anyone in the car from the outside. Another is a baby mirror. But what it allows me to do is, when I'm doing my normal free mirror search, I also include this, which gives me the blind side, the, particularly the blind side that I'm on. Because again, drive-by shootings, starting the attack from a situation where, you know, it comes from a blind angle, you rob them of that capability. And you don't have to look like you're looking. Walking around it, I'm going to see that the wheels are turned the same Checking out the car is a repetitive but important job. First, do a walk around, looking at the general condition. Are the wheels turned the same way that you left them? Are the mirrors in the proper position? Once you feel good about the exterior, it's time to take a closer look. Then we're going to go a little bit more in depth. And typically, the tools that you need for this is a bright handheld light and, and a mechanics mirror. All right, mechanics mirror is going to keep you from having to crawl around and do outlandish things. Okay, all we're going to do now is is we're going to kind of come down, and we're going to look in around the wheel wells, and we're looking for things that don't make sense. I'm going to pay particular attention to the cracks around the doorway to make sure there's no trip wires or any other kind of indication that someone's been in and out of the car. So I keep going with my light, looking, and again I'm putting on this security show. And you know what? When I get up around here. I, oh, see, now I looked in there, and it's the right color, and I can see it with my light on it, but if you look right here where the mirror is, this right above that obvious portion of the uh, car is something that doesn't belong there. So again, all I'm doing here is... At this point, the security crews will call someone trained to handle the problem. If anything's out of place... McCann says the more precautions you take, the less likely you'll find yourself and your clients in a dangerous situation. Remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to transmit the message that we are aware of the potential threat. We have a program that routinely addresses it. And you know what? All things considered, path of least resistance. True for bad guys, too. Criminals are not stupid. Terrorists are not stupid. Corollas are not stupid. But they are lazy. People are lazy, and they, like us, seek the path of least resistance. If you put too many obstacles in front of me, what, is there not like another victim going to check in like tomorrow? Is there not another guy who's totally preoccupied and has all the signatures of worth and value on his person not going to turn the corner on the street in the next five minutes? Why you? Why is there an urgency on you? Most people, the target analysis of the criminal doesn't go to, no, it's him we're after. No, it's opportunity. Look at what just presented himself to me, right here. It's a gift from God, you know? If I just wait, if you're too hard, there'll be another gift. Come right around the corner. Another danger facing executives is kidnapping. Global kidnapping has become a thriving business. Some studies claim 30,000 people have been kidnapped since 1990. Hey, hey. Most Fortune 500 companies uh, have a uh, k &R insurance plan, kidnap and ransom insurance plan. To even talk about the details of those plans nulls and voids the, the plan. So it's a very well-kept secret. However, in, in countries where abduction is a cottage industry, um, they know that if they grab a Fortune 500 person, they're likely to get some money for them. There are things you can do to increase your security. The first dimension by manipulating corporate culture and by manipulating the way you go about your life, lessening the possibility that you might be selected for victimization right from the start. Secondly, making it physically more difficult to uh, attack a facility, get close to your car, do those things by putting on what really res results in a security show for the consumption of the surveillance. And then thirdly, at the point of impact, we got some pretty rugged people that'll get in the way. Go! Go! Who the bad guys are is not necessary to define them. We know now, we know more than before, that there are many, many bad guys that looking for an opportunity to make big damage 
in America and abroad. The good news is that you can do something to counteract the security threats. You can also make your jet travel safer if your plane is properly maintained and your crew is well trained. Safety expert Robert Breiling tracks all business jet accidents. 60-70% are pilot related and it's just human, human mistakes. Another 10% are mechanical maintenance failure. His information is then used by companies around the world to make jets safer and to better train pilots. He says the number one safety concern before you get on the plane is who is at the control. Crew experience. Who's flying me? Who's in front driving this thing? Even if it breaks and it's not well maintained, it doesn't get it on the ground if they know how to handle it. What's the experience level of those two fellows up front? Breiling was the force behind getting the FAA to approve the use of the flight simulator for pilot training. And for good reason. There had been more than 70 accidents while pilots were training. Simulators allowed pilots to push the edge without taking real risks. Yeah, we'll take a look this way. Where are we now? Yeah. In the mountains of Telluride. The first simulators came out about 83, 84, and the accident rate, 87, really started to drop because these people could practice their engine out emergencies or accelerate stop distances on the runways, aborted takeoffs, engine failures, all in a simulator. Board left, engine fire. The simulator is now mandatory training for commercial pilots for major carriers. Bombardier Aerospace has an in-house training operation used by the pilots for its FlexJet's fractional ownership program. And we'll continue a turn heading to the north. I think one of the neat things about the simulator is that you can actually learn to fly without ever getting in an airplane. Not that we do it, but they are so real. Um, and you can throw so much at somebody in a simulator like that. They get so well prepared because if you've been in the simulator and, you, and things start to go wrong and buttons start to you know, blink and things happen, you have to be very level-headed. And, and in the case of these simulators, we can throw you know, weather, or engine failures, all kinds of things at them. So when they're actually flying the airplanes, they're very, very well prepared. Climb, climb. Clear of conflict. You can practice all your emergency procedures in that simulator. You can actually shoot your approach in any airport in the world or any major airport and practice it there before you get in the real airplane. Down, spoilers come out. And let's get the thrust reversers out. The training received by business pilots Simulator-based training is the finest in the world. The hours required to obtain a job with a major company are many. In fact, you'll find that the credentials of a business pilot are frequently higher than the, new, the requirements for somebody who is a new hire on an airline. This focus on training is also reflected in the accident reports for business aviation compared to commercial aviation. Right now, let me define the accident rates. The corporate professionally flown had no accidents, no jet accidents last year. There are only two accidents involving turboprop airplanes. This was 2003. Corporate aviation professionally flown has an accident rate of 0.03 uh, versus the airline. Point three. So last year it was 10 times better. But over the years, I'd say, I like to say it's equal to or better than the scheduled air carriers. The safety record of turbine powered aircraft flown by two person professional crews, the lion's share of business aviation, is the best in all of air transportation. The airlines offer excellent, safe transportation. But when you go on an airliner, you are essentially 
buying their safety culture. Whereas a flight department can create its own safety culture. And that safety culture has been practiced at the highest levels of sophistication. The safety record reflects that high level of sophistication. Another advantage private jets have over commercial airlines is that they can update their planes with the latest equipment much faster. Business aircraft are most of the time at the leading edge of the avionics technology. There are a couple of reasons for that. If a company, the ABC company, has two or three airplanes and they want to add the latest collision avoidance system or the latest terrain warning system, they only have to equip two or three airplanes to do so. But if an airline must move into new technology, they have to equip a whole fleet of airplanes. So you'll find that the new technology finds its way into business jets before it finds its way into airliners. In a lot of cases, the business jets actually exceed the avionics capability of the commercial airlines. A couple of examples for that. Uh, one of the things that's common in business jets now, particularly at the upper end, are heads-up displays, where the pilot actually looks through and sees on a screen in front of them all the information they need as they look out the window of the cockpit. Got everything. There's the runway. Boy, it's coming out real nice. Another example is something called enhanced vision. This is something that is new on a Gulfstream aircraft, uh, where you can actually see through the clouds and have a more enhanced picture of the airport you're trying to get in. Look how far, you, yeah, this is great. Look, the approach, look, God, look how far you can see the lights on EBS. Owners of business jets are driving the development of this new technology because they're going global and pushing their way into areas less traveled. The operating environment for the business jet is more demanding because they go in such a wide range of airports. And using avionics can help them maintain a tremendous level of safety as they operate into and out of rural airports, uh, go in all kinds of weather conditions. For some of the commercial people, they've got people on the ground that can help them uh, walk through precision approaches at the commercial airports precision era approach in some of the smaller airports in the rural areas just aren't available. These high-end avionics become extremely important when a pilot hits bad weather. The business jet has the latest in radar equipment to find out where the storms are. It has the latest in spherics to determine where the lightning is. It has the ability to fly very high and frequently over the thunderstorms. So you'll find that the flight in a business jet is as protected, if not more so, than the flight in an airliner. Well, you hope you avoid the worst weather because that's why they have radar that goes out 250, 300 miles and you can see the storm, not only the storm, but you can see the intensity of the storm on your radar. And today's airplanes can top a lot of this weather get above it, avoid it, have a comfortable ride. Business jets are not only equipped with the latest radar, but the major private jet companies also have their own advanced weather stations, constantly tracking conditions. Like this one at Bombardier Aerospace for its FlexJets program. Basically what I do is uh, two functions. One is uh, we plan for the next day's flying operations. And what I do is forecast the weather and look for any potential problems where we can't get in or out of any airport. For example, um, Austin to uh, Columbus, Ohio, point to point at a specific time. So really every day we are putting out about 300 forecasts. Because of the innovations big business jet owners are incorporating in their operations, the safety and security of private jet travel is quite high. But keeping that safety record high depends on the operators. Companies must have safe operational standards that both the company and pilots adhere to. Safe standards include flying with two rested pilots, not flying when the weather is below the minimum recommendation and not flying into certain airports. The big companies usually have tough rules in place 
but some small charter companies are not quite so insistent. The private jet charter industry is experiencing incredible growth. Demand for the service has soared by more than 75% since 1995. But when accidents do happen, public confidence is eroded. Pro golfer Payne Stewart was a victim of one of the most high-profile private jet accidents. He was on a chartered flight from Orlando to Dallas in a Learjet 35. Within five minutes of takeoff, air traffic control lost radio contact. The plane, flying on automatic pilot, went 1,400 miles before running out of fuel and nosediving into a field. The airplane had repeated problems with the pressurization system, dump valve. It had just undergone maintenance on that again. When they take an airplane in the hangar and do maintenance, they turn off the oxygen system, like lifting the hood of your car and turning it off. The cause of the problem leading to the crash is unknown. Theories range from a sudden loss of cabin pressure, possibly caused by the oxygen valve, or it could have been pilot error. The captain had something like 4,000 hours, largely military, very well experienced individual, but only three or 400 hours in all Lear jets, and very few in this particular type airplane. And Lear jets at that age vary. Uh, his co pilot was very new and inexperienced. They did in house training, I believe. And uh, did he, we'll never know whether he looked to see if the oxygen was turned on under the hood. The pilot had received certification to fly the plane just four days earlier. The government rushed an investigation team to the crash site. We've done a study and an ally analyzed this, and the pilot has 65 to 70 percent greater chance of having an accident if he has less than 3,000 hours. And experience in type, in model airplane, it's like you going from a Chevrolet to a Ferrari. It takes you a while to get experience and, and feel comfortable in that. And we feel that uh, you need this time and type and, and exposure before you're a safer pilot. If Stewart had been aware of these factors, he might not have boarded the plane. The lesson we should all take away from this tragedy is to be aware of the crew's experience and safety standards. It's unfortunate that many people think a pilot is a pilot. They're not. Uh, you can look at the, uh, some of these charter operators, accident, operator accidents recent years. Uh, captain in one particular accident was very, was very well qualified on paper. He had 4,000 some odd hours in the Air Force, but he only had several hundred hours in the particular jet he was flying. And he really wasn't that experienced with it. Plus that operation did training on their own, didn't go to a flight safety or a semi-flight or a professional training company. Experts say, not surprisingly, it's also safer to fly with two well-qualified pilots in the cockpit. If you had somebody there, he could call your altitudes off. He would look at the missed approach procedure, say, OK, Charlie, turn left, 160, could climb to two of us, climb a certain altitude and things like that. It's tough to fly single pilot. If everything goes well, you can do it. But if you have, a, and I've done it, and when I thought I was very well experienced and I taught myself a lesson, when, the, when you can't get in and get into a missed approach procedure, in a, this was in New York City, in a high density area, they can give you a clearance you can hardly copy and keep that airplane in a holding pattern. It's difficult. Breiling says there are some very important procedures you should follow before you charter any plane. What type of airplane? Is it fairly new? Uh, particularly the crew, what's their experience? Crew turnover, have these people worked there for a long time or if there's a large amount of crew change, crew turnover, there's something wrong with the operation. Check the insurance. What kind of insurance do they have so you're covered if something happens? So if you're flying with a charter company, it's important to be discriminating. But what if you're in a fractional ownership program? In these programs, a customer buys into a timeshare plan and depends on the company to provide a top-rated pilot that is familiar with the plane. 
statistics show that these programs don't have as many accidents as charters. Fractionals have done very well. They've been going since, well, started in 86 or so, but really didn't get up to speed until the 90s. They've had no fatal accidents, and their accident rate is about comparable to corporate professionally flown. NetJets says safety is the number one priority. They have their own weather center with the latest technology and a full-time staff that dispatches the planes. They also spend a great deal of time and money training and retraining their pilots. We train our pilots 23 days a year. That's probably twice as much as the average commercial airline. Uh, we have two times a year they go to flight safety for simulated training. Uh, we have 13 today full-time meteorologists. We have licensed dispatchers. I mean, we, we, I guess people call it overkill, but basically that's, you know, the, the premise and the promise that I make to my owners is that, I mean, basically, I look and say, you've put your life in my hands, and we will do everything possible to make it the safest possible operation in the world. This kind of commitment is one of the reasons corporate aviation safety record is so good. The pilots themselves uh, undergo a tremendous amount of training. They have a lot of hours of experience and they spend a lot of time going back with what's known as recurrent training. So the pilots in the corporate world are really second to none and the safety record reflects that. Companies who operate fractional plans are also very careful about who they will allow in the program. After the events of September 11th, they became even tougher. It's a terrible thing to say, but we probably profiled more than before. We do background checks on our owners as well since 9-11, as well as, as, as uh, all of our pilots, of course. And, and so we are very concerned about that. We look very carefully as to who our owners are, uh, and we do thorough, hopefully thorough checks enough uh, thorough checks on, on who our new owners are. Unlike a commercial airplane where you're basically catering to the mass public where the passengers are somewhat nameless and faceless, uh, in, in this particular world the passengers and the pilots are both well known to each other and that familiarity we think is an important security benefit. You know who's flying your airplane you know that the airplane hasn't been touched by anyone, uh, and you know the people flying on it. And so, obviously, by definition, it's significantly more secure than going to a commercial airline where you just walk through a gate and hope that everyone's gone through the same gate and they've caught anyone that has you know, some kind of weapon. Bottom line, jet travel, both commercial and private, is very safe. But the experts say you must be your own advocate and help the system keep you safe. Do you have some type of notification? You are responsible for yourself. And if you don't have an executive assistant who does this or you don't have a staff that does this for you that you can delegate, then you need to do it. And all of that information is largely available on the net. Um, you just have to go about building a security plan that you say, I'm going to do these things in this checklist whenever I travel. All right. We have a technology of excellent aircraft designs, a very strong safety culture, a very strong security culture. All that blends together to have business aviation be an integral part of our nation's transportation system. The private jet aviation system is growing and developing rapidly around the world. Security will remain a concern, but there are things you can do. New technology and better training will ensure that flying privately continues to become even safer. It's a remarkable combination of human ingenuity and hardware that has been harnessed to serve the needs of people who travel the globe. <laughs>